So uh, we're resuming our hearing of August 12th, and next we have uh, North Country. Um, I'll ask uh, Mark Hengstler to swear in the North Country witnesses, and then Mr. Frank will turn it to you and your team for your presentation. Thank you for being here. Thank you, sir. Hey, good afternoon, North Country. So I'm going to uh, administer the oath prescribed for witnesses, and the way we'll do this is I'll read the oath, um, I'll have each of you then say your name, raise your right hand, and, and say I do. We'll have you go in just in order rather than all at once so that court reporter has your names and we're all set there. Uh, so the oath, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the full truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Tracy? Tracy Paul, I do. Denise Carter, I do. Steve Wright, I do. Greg Walker, I do. Thanks a lot. You're now sworn in. I'll turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Um, I'll just turn to Mr. Frank for their presentation. Okay, we'll kick it off. So first of all, Chair Foster and Green Mountain Care Board, thank you very much for allowing us to present to you today our Budget 25. Um, I am Tom Frank. I'm the president and CEO here at North Country Hospital. Immediately to my left is Tracy Paul. She is our chief operating officer, and for this year, she also served as our chief financial officer, both roles. Next to her is Denise Carter. Denise is our chief nursing officer. Immediately to my right is Dr. Greg Walker. He's our chair of anesthesia and our med staff president. And to Greg's right is Steve Wright. Steve is a vice chair of our board, and he's also uh, the executive director of Jay Peak Resort. So I'd like to start off by telling you all a little bit of who we are. Uh, we are North Country Hospital. We are located in Newport, Vermont, uh, in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, we're a 106-year-old uh, organization, and we're looking forward to the next 100. Um, we have some unique challenges that uh, some of our other hospitals don't necessarily experience, and the number one is distance. Uh, as a critical access hospital, we are the only critical access that meets the specifics in the government regulations of a critical access hospital for distance. We're 45 miles from the nearest hospital, and we're two hours from the nearest tertiary, either Dartmouth or UVM, on a good day. We have the same issues that other hospitals experience around housing. Um, housing in the Northeast Kingdom is not readily available, especially for rentals. It's not readily available for a lot of our citizens, and it's very expensive if it is, as it is around the state of Vermont and probably most of the country. We have unique uh, economic challenges here in the Northeast Kingdom. We're the most economically challenged area in the state of Vermont. With respect to transportation, um, when it comes to transferring patients, many of our patients don't even own their own vehicles in the Northeast Kingdom. We have to rely on EMS to get our patients out or DART. DART, for instance, only flies approximately 40% of the time due to weather restrictions. With respect to EMS, um, if we have to send our patients from the Northeast Kingdom outside of the area, past Dartmouth, past UVM, that could tie up an ambulance for greater than 12 hours. And that happens on a regular basis. We have sent patients to Connecticut, to New York, to Boston. It happens. Our, a lot of our patients here are on Medicare and Medicaid. 70% of our payer mix is Medicare, Medicaid. Only 28% of our population is commercial. If for some reason, one of our patients that we transfer do not have insurance, which does happen, it is on the hospital to pay EMS for those transfers of those patients. We are a hospital that takes care of our community. We are, what, to me, the definition of what a true community hospital is. 92% of our discharges from our inpatient unit are patients from our community, which is high father, a high higher percentage than any other hospital in the state of Vermont. As I said, our payout mix is 70% government, pretty much evenly split between Medicare and Medicaid, 28% commercial. What we're seeing, as the world is seeing, is a bigger percentage of Medicare turning into Medicare Advantage. Medicare Advantage does not reimburse at the same rate as Medicare. It is a commercial product. Um, we don't, we're not able to be cost reimbursed for any costs associated with Medicare Advantage. And Medicare Advantage does not necessarily cover the same services that Medicare does. 
I want to tell you a quick story about one of our patients, and this is a true story, and this is not unique. This happens. We have an 80-year-old uh, woman who was a patient of ours who was on Medicare. She was, she was lonely. She was by herself. Her kids weren't in the area. True story. A salesman for a Medicare Advantage plant was calling her almost daily to check on her, see how she's doing, making sure she's okay so she feels safe. She felt bad, and so she finally signed up for the Medicare Advantage plan through that individual. The day she signed up, that individual stopped calling. And when she came to the hospital, she found out she had less care, less paid for care than what she had when she was on Medicare. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous for people who are most at risk. I just thought it was important that you folks hear that story because I'm sure you're hearing it from all over the state. We built our budget specifically to meet the needs of our community. We're not going to compare statistics financially to other hospitals in the state. We're not going to have some big, large PowerPoint presentation today that's going to show you how much money we need compared to somebody else. As I said, we are a hospital that takes care of our own. We're a hospital that takes care of the Northeast Kingdom. We presented a budget to you folks that asks for a 4.5% fee increase. That equates to slightly less than $2 million. We have a net patient revenue growth of 1%. We have reduced expenses by 0.41% from budget 24 to fully loaded budget 25. And we still produce a 2% margin with that budget. Again, that budget was built for this community and it was made with some very difficult decisions in mind. And as we go through this presentation, you're gonna hear some of those decisions. So as we discussed last year, um, well, I've been here 16 months now, and as we discussed at last year's presentation, we've come into a situation that requires a significant turnaround. Turnaround from a lot of areas. A turnaround from reputation, morale, uh, from finances, on and on. Uh, following COVID, we made a decision as an organization that we needed to change EMRs, and we went with Cerner Community Works. And to be honest with you, Cerner Community Works from has has devastated this organization. We've lost $10.8 million over the last two years, which I can directly attribute to the implementation or failed implementation of that product. But over the last year, we've really worked hard on certain pillars that we've created in order to turn our organization around so that we can continue to meet the needs of the Northeast Kingdom. Our first was morale, culture, and reputation. Our reputation had taken a significant hit in the community. Our morale was very low and our culture was, was failing. We've done a lot of work on that area, all three of those areas to improve those numbers because if you don't have a strong culture in this organization, we will not succeed. And so we've worked hard to do that. We've done a lot of different things uh, to try to build that morale. First of all, a fully transparent senior team. No decisions are made in a vacuum. It's made amongst three players. It's made with the senior team, those decisions. It's made with our med staff, and it's made with the board. All three groups, fully transparent to the organization and community, build trust back in leadership. We've recently taken an employee survey, and we hoped our scores would be a little higher than they are, but overall, the scores weren't as bad as they could have been. Um, our highest score was... Um, I have great pride in my job. Higher national average, higher than it was four years ago, the last time a survey was taken. That to me indicates right there that we have pride in our organization. The lowest score, unfortunately, was pay. And we knew that was gonna be the case. If you recall, last year, we only built in a 2% increase for our employees. And that increase occurred halfway through the year. So in reality, our staff last year only received a 1% increase. That's not sustainable when you have inflation that's running 3.5% or more. This year, we've built in a 4% increase for our staff. It's absolutely necessary that we're able to recruit and retain our staff. And the 4%, hopefully, will get us to where we need to be. Quality. When I arrived 16 months ago, our quality department was devastated. We had lost our quality director. We had one new associate or assistant director come on board. So we needed to put some energy money into our quality because quality obviously is, as I've said before, is job one. 
We hired a young lady by the name of Julie Rafon. Julie Rafon is known throughout the state for her work with the Blueprint, one of the originators of the whole Blueprint system. Um, she's worked for us historically, and her, 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 her forte is quality. Uh, once we get to uh, Denise, she'll talk about some of the benchmarking we do with quality and who we benchmark against. Employer of choice. We were losing people left and right. We've stopped that loss. We've actually got people coming back to us. We have resumes for positions we haven't had in two years. Um, so we're really doing much better on filling those positions. Denise will talk about the fact that we're fully staffed in many areas that had travelers not more than a year ago. Access to care. That's why we're here. We're a primary care focused organization with some specialty care. This year, we've been fortunate enough for the budget next year to be able to hire three new primary care physicians. One is a local gentleman who grew up in the community, who came back from the military, and will be working out of our southern clinic in Barton. A second recruit who came from southern New Hampshire, has relatives in the area, he too will be working out of Barton. And a third recruit who we just hired uh, is fresh out of residency, and she's going to be working in Newport. We continue to invest in primary care because that's what we do. We provide 99% of the primary care in Orleans County. We do not have an FQHC that exists within Orleans County. Primary care. So when I arrived, or several years ago, two years ago to be exact, primary care was losing in the clinic itself about $4 million a year. A lot of that was attributable to the to CERN. The, what we needed to do to make primary care function under the new EMR CERN was, was outrageous with respect to staffing models, with efficiencies, with the number of patients that doctors could see. It was out of control. We made an investment this year and brought in Kaufman Hall. Kaufman Hall is a national consultant that's worked in the state many times, both at UVM and I worked with them in Rutland. They were helped to provide us a guide to what we need to do to reduce that deficit, increase access, and increase the number of patients our providers see. Tracy Paul will get much more into the detail of that as our chief operating officer, but I will tell you that loss went from four million two years ago, and in our budget next year, it's a million and a half. Our physicians are now seeing 16 patients per day, up from what was 12 to 14 patients a day, and we're doing many other things from an efficiency perspective to improve that access. Financial discipline, one of the pillars, obviously a biggie. So the first thing we did when I got here is we eliminated two vice president positions, gone. Uh, we, input, we, we put in place a soft freeze for all positions. Every single position in the organization, whether it's new or whether it's replacement, has to come through the senior team with approval from their vice president. If a clinical position is approved, that position is posted immediately so that we don't lose out on access and taking care of our patients. If it's an administrative position that's approved, we lag that position for three months before we post it. By lagging it, we get financial improvement, but it also gives the opportunity to the leader in that area to see if they can create a, a system within that area where they might not require that position, and that's actually happened. Cerner. CERNA and operability. We, when I arrived, have tried to work with CERNA to correct some of the issues that existed since day one. They have been unwilling to work with us and partner with us on helping us turn this around. We also had to invest this year in bringing in someone for revenue cycle to help us try to make our rev cycle work efficiently. It's not just about expenses and expense efficiency, it's also about revenue cycle efficiency. We need to get paid for the work we do, just like anyone else would want to and need to. So we had to expend some serious dollars in order to help do that, and we're seeing the benefit of that. We're starting to see more cash come in the door, which is really important, obviously, for our needs. Unfortunately, with the uncooperation of CERNA, we had to make the very difficult and expensive decision to sue them. We are currently um, in arbitration. Um, I can't say too much more to that based on contract obligations, but I will tell you that we are moving forward with that lawsuit. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about alternatives to Cerner, if we can uh, ultimately um, be successful in what we need to do to achieve in that lawsuit. Infrastructure. We currently have a $28 million CON that exists 
to redo our uh, med search for our progressive care unit, to redo our lab, and to um, add and improve our ED. I put the stop on the third floor, our med surge, and on the lab, because right now we simply can't afford it. We need to find a more, um, a less expensive, more efficient model, and so we're working with our architects on that. With respect to our ED, we did make an investment. We invested three and a half million dollars in our ED. Ligature secure rooms for our mental health patients. Three and a half million dollars. Just two weeks ago, we had six mental hold patients. One of which, and Denise will talk more detail, was a child that needed to stay here multiple days. We as a critical access hospital are not prepared to treat a mental health patients the way they needed to have the treatment that's required. We do not have psychiatrists. We do not have mental health beds. We are no more able to, as a critical acts hospital, treat these folks the way they needed to be treated any more than if we did open heart surgery. And I can tell you, you don't want us to do an open heart surgery. And these people should not be sitting in our ED for days at a time. So we talked about difficult decisions. Some of the difficult decisions we made this year was to eliminate our knee and hip joint replacement orthopedic surgeon. Orthopedic surgeons are the most expensive resource from a physician perspective that a hospital can have. Base salary is $650,000 a year plus benefits. We just could not afford to continue to do that with the volume we had. It's not great for our service area and we've caught a lot of grief for this, but we had no choice from a financial perspective to, to steer our patients in a different direction. We believe that there are options for those joint replacements at NVRH, which we're gonna talk about our relationship with them in a moment. UVM, Rutland, all have excellent programs that allow our patients to be serviced outside of the kingdom. Urology, we lost our urologist. Another incredibly expensive resource that we cannot afford to hire full time. Historically, for 15 or 20 years, we were able to get a two day a week urologist from UVM. They no longer can provide us that service. We cannot afford a full time urologist. So we're gonna be working with NVRH on a model that allows us to place uh, a uh, nurse practitioner or urology nurse practitioner in one of our clinics at a 0.4% with a direct route to the urologist at an NVRH. We can treat our patients, but unfortunately we can no longer afford to provide that service. As we prepared our budget, one of the things we absolutely recognize is the cost of healthcare in the state. And believe me, I mean, you guys are all over. We hear it all the time. Healthcare is too expensive. Healthcare is too expensive. And we recognize that. And that means that we can no longer provide everything we provided in the past. And as we built this budget, we had to take that into consideration. And you see that in our expense number that is actually down budget over budget. Tracy will get into more of the financial detail when it's her turn to talk. One of the things this organization hasn't done in six years is a really full-blown strategic plan. We've now taken on that, and we're going to be doing a strategic plan on our organization, and we're working with a group uh, that's completely grant-funded. It's the Rural, excuse me while I look it up again. It is the Rural Health Design Center. They are fully grant-funded. They're going to be working with us on that strategic plan. The work's already begun. So instead of just putting out fires, we're hoping to actually look forward to the next three years. We'll talk a little bit about transformation, healthcare transformation. We all worked with Dr. Hamry and his group. I had many, 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 many conversations with Dr. Hamry and, and looking at some of the recommendations, they all make sense. And some of the recommendations, all the recommendations, to be honest with you, are things we're already working on. Telehealth, one of the things that he spoke highly of is to utilize telehealth. We currently get telehealth for neurology, telehealth, psychiatry, from Dartmouth. Now, as an example, every time that we see a, a telehealth patient in neurology, we pay Dartmouth $680 for that visit. For Medicare, we're able to recruit $27 for that visit. For Medicaid, we recruit zero. From commercial, $78. The only thing we can bill 
is what's called the Q code, which is the facility code. Dr. Merman, you probably know a lot about that. We spent $70,000 a quarter on telemedicine. It's the best thing for our patients. It's one of the decisions we made as a loss leader to continue to do. But as you can imagine, that's another financial burden placed on us that we have no opportunity to get reimbursed on. Primary care investment, I've already talked to you about primary care investment. On top of what I've already talked about, we made a decision here to hire a full-time psychiatric nurse practitioner to work with our primary care patients, not to come into the hospital, not to come into the ED, but to work with our existing patients in primary care. So I want to talk about NBRH and what we're working on NBRH. This is something that's been in the works since April. Sean Tester, the CEO down at NBRH and I are very much on the same page. Um, what we're doing is, is we brought together in April our operations and finance people to sit down and begin to list out some of the things that we could work together on to create a Northeast Kingdom Health Service with two independent hospitals. Just last week, Tracy met with a counterpart at NVRH and began to sketch out what it looks like to work closer on cardiology, to work closer on orthopedics, to work closer on urology. How can we do that? Joint recruitment for a specialist. We, those are what we could probably do if we could work with them on a joint recruitment. Our HR person also visited with NVRH recently, and we're working to create consistent processes and protocols so that when our patient comes here or a patient goes to NBRH, they're experiencing the same exact thing from a protocol and process perspective. Our boards are going to be getting together in, in the October timeframe as we continue to plan this out. Our expectation is we're going to see actual results from this and begin to put things into place no later than the beginning of fiscal year 25. We're already looking at educational opportunities. Uh, we offer an um, a, 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 a bunch training which is a de-escalation training that where we're going to be bringing folks from NVRH up to participate in that training so that we're saving expenses. We're also looking at back office functions. You know, we currently need a compliance office in our organization. Can we work with NVRH on a compliance office? They, if they need a CNO, can Denise do both North Country and NVRH? These are all things and all things that are in the works. And, and I do anticipate that you're going to see some real action in the beginning of 25. Urgent care, another thing that was recommended to us. We are, we do have an, our urgent care in downtown Newport. We did partner with the um, FQHC, um, Northern counties out of Essex County to work with us on that and to set it up. They're more of an expert than we are. Um, we've seen great results from that. Our lower acuity patients are definitely utilizing the urgent care. Unfortunately, our ED volume has not decreased, but we're seeing higher acuity. And again, Denise can speak to that. Um, unfortunately, we also have, I'll be honest with you, too many of our Medicaid patients often use our ED as primary care. Regardless of access, regardless of availability of appointment, you know, we have, you know, uh, NP dedicated to seeing same day appointments. Oftentimes we find that our ED is being utilized for primary care. It's something we work on. Unfortunately, you know, when you talk about waste in healthcare, there's, your, there's, there's a component of waste. You know, why is our ED being utilized by, for primary care? We continue to work that out. Joint replacements, we already talked about that. We made the decision to move away from hips and knees. I want to talk real quick about relationships with other hospitals. Although when we do our budget presentation, we're all siloed individuals. That doesn't necessarily mean we don't work closely with other hospitals in the state. We work very closely with UVM. We contract pathology services through UVM. We work with, we work with them on neonatology very closely. Pediatrics, the pediatric assessment award that we won, the highest score in the state of Vermont. That was presented to us by UVM. Denise will talk about that. We have outpatient dialysis that comes from UVM. We provide the space. They provide the physician. And exploring EPIC. We have the opportunity through something called Community Connection to get onto EPIC through UVM. That doesn't mean that we're affiliated with UVM, doesn't mean we're any part of the network. It just gives us the opportunity to afford to potentially bring EPIC into our hospital. So Sonny Epen, to his credit, is working very closely. His IT team is working very closely with ours and what it looks like to be able to do that.
That'll be a huge benefit for our patients, if you, as you can imagine. Dartmouth, talked about teleneurology. We talked about telepsychiatry. They also do some reads for us on cardiology and help us with that. We are, uh, we're part of the pur purchasing group NIA, all through Dartmouth. Um, you know, our physicians here, depending on who it is, either has a great relationship with Dartmouth or a great relationship with the specialist at UVM. So we have the ability to cherry pick that, which is actually an advantage to our organization without being affiliated with either one. Ovation. You've heard about Copley and Northwest Medical Center and Brattleboro working together on this collaborate. So we've kicked the tires on the collaborate. We're not ready to jump in full speed. However, we are in the process of reviewing what it looks like to get supplies for, through them versus NIA. So there's another opportunity for us to turn over another stone and look for an opportunity to save us money in our organization. Denise is going to talk about other collaborations we have for trainings, et cetera. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Denise, unless you folks have a specific question for me before we move on. All right, I'm Denise Carter, Chief Nursing Officer, and last year I was in the interim role, and I'm permanent this year. They decided to keep me around. So I'm going to continue with Tom's Pillars, uh, Morale, Culture, and Reputation. This year we decided to join the DAISY Foundation. Uh, this is a meaningful award. It's a nationally recognized and respected award. We kicked it off in May during our Nurses Week celebration dinner. Um, we wanted to do something for our nurses that would be community recognized because uh, nominations come from patients, visitors, and families, but we can also recognize their excellent and compassionate care. Our selection team meets in September and we're going to choose our first recipient. I'm really excited about that. As Tom mentioned, we received the Pediatric Readiness Award this year. This is a state initiative for emergency departments across Vermont to improve pediatric care. Uh, Dr. Nelson and Kate Soons um, presented us the award in June, and we received the highest level in innovator. And as Tom said, we were told we had the highest score in the state. This was uh, the result of collaboration throughout departments in our hospital to look at processes, policies, and supplies. We also partnered with our local EMS and our pediatric offices. We're really proud of this recognition and the care that we provide our pediatric patients. For the employee pillar, we've been able to decrease travelers this year and due mostly to our partnership with Vermont State University and the high school, North Country High School. We recently re-engaged with the high school's career center and their adult learning program. We have staff who volunteer to speak to students and then leaders who um, attend student events showcasing product, uh, their projects throughout the school year. We're now a clinical site for adult learners for their LNA program. And that starts this fall. When Copley couldn't host um, an LPN clinical rotation this fall, VSU reached out to us. And we're in the process of uh, securing an instructor. And when we once that's done, we'll have an RN clinical rotation and two LPN rotations in the fall. These partnerships allow us to keep potential RNs and LPNs in the pipeline for future needs for our hospital and primary care. We have six new grads that started our new grad residency program July 1st. All six are graduates of VSU. We continue to evaluate the need to fill every position, as Tom said. Um, every position has to go through the approval process with senior team. For financial discipline, we restarted our value, value analysis team, or VET. Um, this team is, has representation from across the hospital. Every supply or product has to be requested to be evaluated by this team, and then um, it, 
approved once uh, everyone's had a chance to look at it to see quality, cost, and they look at all angles for each request that comes through. We are halfway to our goal of saving $500,000 this year through the VET. Our pharmacy um, has been looking at medications, looking at name brand and generic, and we've seen substantial savings this year by switching out some of the meds to generic. But we recently had to make a difficult decision about no longer offering Ultimaris and Solaris to patients in our outpatient infusion center. The cost for the medications was so high and our reimbursement was low, we just couldn't, we just made the decision that we couldn't continue to afford to do that. So our patients will now have to travel some elsewhere in the state to receive this medication. Denise, I think the expense was the excess of 1.2 million. Yeah, the cost for the two medications for annual cost was 1.2 million dollars. And so Ultimaris, for example, one dose is $106,000, but our reimbursement was $27,000. So we just can't continue to afford to provide that. Under quality, Tom already talked about our ED renovation. Um, this is a project that started last October. We opened four private rooms in June multi-purpose, they have um, cardiac monitoring, negative pressure, but by closing a door, as Tom said, they're ligature resistant. And that will make them safe for members in our community who are in mental health crisis. We have created a plan to improve throughput in the emergency department for um, by utilizing a space for lower acuity patients or a fast track area. We have APPs who will come down and help during times of surge to see those patients. Our, we've decentralized our pharmacist. They're no longer just in the pharmacy department. They now have a presence in our emergency department, our outpatient infusion center, and our inpatient units. And their primary focus is patient safety. So they're reviewing uh, med recs for patients who are being admitted from the ED or who have uh, complex medications or a lot of comorbidities. They're reviewing new medications with patients and their caregivers to be sure they understand what they're taking and why and side effects to look for. They're also working with nursing staff to be a resource to them, dosing medications for physicians and just being a support. Over the past six months, we implemented our point of care ultrasound program a best practice to improve patient outcomes. It also decreases the time it takes to get results and improves throughput. The program medical director has trained physicians, APPs, and nurses across the hospital to provide this service. We couldn't care for our patients without our community partners, and we have many that we, um, we partner with. Our director for education has recently gone to visiting nurses association to train them in pick line, midline, and central line care. We did that so that our patients who need a long-term antibiotic therapy could be home for their therapy and without the, without increasing hospital length of stay. For our mental health patients, we partner with Journey to Recovery. They have one social detox bed for patients seeking um, help for drug or alcohol addiction. It's a short term but safe place for them to wait until a rehab bed is available. Journey to Recovery has someone 24-7 who can assess, offer resources, and education. If the bed is occupied though, the patient is discharged back into the community to wait for an inpatient treatment bed where they are vulnerable and at risk. We support Journey to Recovery by providing bedding, linen, and meals for their detox bed, and that helps also to minimize delays um, by getting the space ready for the next patient. The front porch recently opened in our community, and we're happy about that. It's a, 
um, open during the day, mental health, urgent care. Um, our ED manager has been working closely with them to see how we can utilize their services. By utilizing their services, we can minimize uh, mental health holds in the ED, as Tom talked about. Um, holds in the ED increases wait times and limits the capacity to see patients. The night that Tom mentioned where we had six mental health holds in the department, that meant we had five beds available to see other patients. It was night shift and uh, the house supervisor had to get help from anyone that was available within the hospital to sit with the patients per our protocol. We held one patient for 52 hours. That was our pediatric patient before uh, a bed was available in New Hampshire at St. Joseph's. We held another patient for 120 hours. Multiple referrals were made. Um, he was turned down by Brattleboro, Ray of Hope, Rutland Regional, Wyndham Center, and St. Joseph's. CDC, MC, and UVM were willing but both were at capacity, and they thought they may have a bed in maybe three days. So we partnered with NKHS and decided he could be safely planned home with a sibling to wait for an open bed. Umbrella is another community resource that we partner with for survivors of domestic and sexual violence. To support our community during this vulnerable time, we have a SANE program. We have four nurses certified as SANE for adults and one for SANE as SANE for pediatrics. An advocate from Umbrella is available to assist, advocate, and provide support in the emergency department and during exams. For pediatric victims this year, we partnered with Orleans County Child Advocacy Center. They offer ongoing training, monthly case studies, and meetings for providers across the county involved with pediatric sexual assault and human trafficking. Our SANE coordinator is working with Copley and NVRH to create a SANE network to share on call supplies and best practices to support our community. You know that about transportation challenges, we have one company that we work with, Rural Community Transportation, or RCT. It's our only option if there isn't family, friends, or a facility that can transport the patient. After hours, patient must stay, patients must stay in the emergency department or inpatient unit and wait for the next morning when RCT is available. Holding those patients decreases our capacity to see patients or to admit them. We partner, as Tom said, with our local EMS um, to transport patients home or back to their facility. The criteria and the documentation needed um, has been a is becoming increasingly challenging. Often families are left with a large out-of-pocket expense, and if the, if the cost is for that ambulance transport isn't approved by their insurance, then the hospital is left with that cost. And as Tom mentioned, we're charged, we're billed according to distance and transporting to our two ter tertiary hospitals, UVM and Dartmouth, two hours away. Those bills can be thousands of dollars. Providers and staff spend hours on the phone to transfer acute or critically ill patients out of the ED or our inpatient unit. When Dartmouth and UVM are at capacity, the search for an open bed expands well beyond Vermont and New Hampshire into New York and Massachusetts. We also depend on community resources to care for our youngest patients. One resource is Department for Children and Families. In the past, we would call them if we felt an infant or child was in an unsafe situation and DCF would file for custody. DCF doesn't intervene unless they feel an infant or child is in danger. If the child is at risk, they are discharged with a safety plan to family. We recently had two challenging pediatric cases in our emergency department. The first was a toddler 
in a car on the side of the road, strapped into their car seat, but not to the car of the vehicle. Mom was slumped over the steering wheel, unresponsive. A pedestrian called 911. Mom was arrested and a child brought to the ED for evaluation. DCF was called. They said the child wasn't in danger, so they recommended we reach out to the dad. After hours of nursing staff making calls to locate him, he finally responded and picked up his child. The second example is a baby boy, a baby boy born here just three months ago. His mom tested for drugs, so for our process, we called DCF. But staff was told that it wasn't enough for them to intervene. They were called an additional 16 times by nursing staff, case management, and his pediatrician. On Sunday, August 4th, this little boy arrived by ambulance to our ED unresponsive. Despite our best efforts, we were not able to resuscitate him. Vermont State Police and the medical examiner arrived to speak with family and staff. DCF showed up later. This death should not have happened. Our system failed this baby. Tom and I have requested a meeting with the Deputy Commissioner for DCF to discuss this and what we can do to prevent another tragedy from this, like this from happening to our community. I'm going to turn it over to Tracy Paul now, our Chief Operating Officer. Good afternoon, everyone. I don't even know how to follow that, but I'm Tracy Paul, the Chief Operating Officer here at North Country Hospital. Uh, we made a decision to delay the recruitment for the CFO um, to help reduce expenses. So I've worked extensively on this budget and we'll be presenting the financial piece today. I said last year that it would be my last budget presentation, but I've learned to say never say never. So here I am again, um, and maybe this will be the last, we'll see. So for this fiscal year, um, in regards to this fiscal year, we um, submitted our projection of coming in at about a $400,000 loss. Um, and as you know, and you've seen the numbers, that's a lot um, smaller than what we've uh, had for the last couple of years. Um, we continue to struggle with our collections, as Tom noted, and he talked about you know a lot of the efforts that we've done to work on that. Our new CFO, because we did hire CFO in April, has extensive experience with the revenue cycle and is making recommendations um, to further improve that area. Um, unfortunately, we recently completed a mid-year cost report, which is something we do, and it shows a potential uh, payback to Medicare, a large amount of money. Um, we are updating those cost report projections right now as we speak, and we'll have a better idea when that's completed of how that's going to affect our year end. We're also looking at prior year cost reports uh, for reimbursement opportunities, looking under every stone and every pair to see if we can have any financial gain. Um, the outcome of this work is really going to affect how our year end is and turns out to be. Cost-based reimbursement through Medicare has its advantages and disadvantages, and what I just spoke to is one of the disadvantages. Because we've decreased our cost so much and done the same amount of work or more, we end up losing reimbursement. Um, it's the conflicting nature of the cost-based reimbursement. So that's affecting our uh, how we're going to end our fiscal year this year. But if we go on to budget 2025 for next year, um, there were three major benchmarks put forth in the budget guidance. The net patient revenue growth couldn't exceed 3.5%. And as Tom said, our NPR was 1%. Our operating margin needed to be positive. We put in a 2% operating margin this year. And the commercial rate couldn't be any more than 3.4%. Due to our large part of percent of government payers, which you've heard a few times already today, we had to submit a budget request of 4.5% on hospital charges. The total net dollars from the 4.5% on gross revenue are $2.6 million. One and a half million of that comes from the commercial payers and 1.1 from the other payers. Again, as Tom had said, we're 70% Medicaid and Medicare and 28% commercial. That really affects what kind of net revenue that we get from each percent of rate increase. 
The rate increases on Medicaid gains no net for us the way we're reimbursed, and we only gain net for outpatient through traditional Medicare. Medicare Advantage has doubled since last year and doesn't yield any more net for us when we increase our rates. Because of this reimbursement structure, we have to ask for the larger rate increase than what was recommended. Um, what goes into that rate increase? First, we look at expenses from budget 24 to budget 25. In our case, we've achieved a substantial decrease on our base expenses. I use base meaning before we've applied inflation because I want to talk about that separately. Before we applied the inflation to our budget, we decreased our expenses by $2.2 million. How did we do this? I can tell you it hasn't been easy. Um, last time we had this meeting, like Tom talked about, we've made hard decisions to increase our financial position. We've instilled financial discipline throughout our organization, and we are going. We are working on our culture to recruit new employees and retain the ones we have. We've worked with our leadership and the rest of our employees to let them know how serious our financial situation has been. This is part of the transparency that Tom has talked about. They've gotten the message loud and clear, and they've responded. What expenses have we decreased? The largest amount of savings has been in the salaries. Salary and benefit costs are 62% of our expenses, so it's the logical place to focus. We have decreased our salary budget by $1.6 million from budget to budget. What have we done? There's been a reduction in the number of the specialty providers. Again, Tom has mentioned this, but I'll mention it again. We have one less orthopedic surgeon, and we no longer have a uro urologist, or I had to give our nurse practitioner in cardiology her notice which was a very difficult conversation. Um, many departments have reduced staff through attrition. As part of the financial discipline, as we talked about, we look at every position. We have some pretty heated conversations in the senior team about the addition or replacement of positions. We lag positions. Our leaders are gotten to the point where they look for other ways to get the job done without automatically looking for a replacement, which is a huge win. Um, there's a lot of collaboration between departments when sharing staffing, uh, short term or long term, long term, this saves money and it creates a great cross training opportunity within our within our departments. Um, some of the other things we've done in the salary and FTE areas is we've combined some roles. One example, we eliminated an FTE by having our ED educator and our ED director be the same individual. We are lucky to find that individual. Um, we haven't filled several va several vacant positions and um, the departments have learned to work without them. Um, we also had filled positions pre previously staffed by RNs with LPNs and MAs when we deemed that appropriate. Um, in regards to the amount of salary dollars, uh, we benchmark our staff salaries and our executive salaries against the 2024 Gallagher Northern New England Healthcare Compensation Survey. Executives are well below the median of the survey as we submitted as part of our budget presentation. Physicians and advanced practice providers are benchmarked using MGMA. So that's the salary piece of it. Um, some other things that we have done is leaders were tasked with finding savings and they did. Um, as Denise had referred to, we got a large amount of pharmaceutical savings from converting brand names to generics, about $500,000. We reviewed contracts for duplication and unused services and terminated them. We've changed our primary distributor for lab supply, saving about $100,000. Um, we've used house LNAs for sitters um, in the uh, ED and other places instead of an outside company. This has allowed us to, to grow our pool of, pool of LNAs to use other places as well as save dollars. Um, we've done small things like changed our website host I mean, there's many other examples, small and large, but I think the point is, is that we've looked across the whole organization and have looked for savings everywhere. Um, we have decreased our needs for locum and travelers. That has saved us about $800,000. We've decreased that need in nurses in the progressive care unit and the maternal child health. We've been able to retain and recruit. We've also had locum physicians in primary care this year. As Tom said, we have three new primary care physicians that are gonna be starting, so we don't have to use the locums anymore. We are very, very pleased with the successful recruitment. More things we're doing to help manage and reduce expenses. Um, we've completed the work to reinstall, what I'll call a reinstall of Premier. 
premieres a productivity system that we've had in the past. We had that system in this hospital for about 10 years. Um, we didn't maintain it during the COVID years during, due to staffing. Um, we've reinstated it and we're gonna use it for staffing decisions to make sure we're staffed appropriately. We are exploring grant opportunities. We have an individual who works in HR who part has part of their time dedicated to helping our staff with grants. Um, and Tom talked about we are engaging with the Rural Health Redesign Center, grant front funded free to us. Um, and we're gonna continue to seek out their assistance for anything that we can use um, above and beyond the strategic plan. So the other part of our rate is inflation. There's $2 million in our budget for inflation. The largest part in it is for salary increases, which is about a million dollars. Like Tom had mentioned, last year we submitted a break-even budget, and the best thing we could do is put in a 2% mid-year rate increase that equal to about 1% for our employees. We had to do better this year. We can't keep locum costs down and not pay our employees better. Um, this budget contains a 4% mid-year rate increase with market adjustments. Um, it's what we need to do for our staff. There's external salary pressures coming from everywhere, which I'm sure you're hearing from everybody. The other largest piece in our inflation is our 5% increase on medical and pharmaceutical supplies. That amounts to about $500,000. Um, we looked at the Vizient uh, data, which says that they project about almost 4% increase next year. So we feel like the 5% is reasonable on those supplies. Our umbrella and liability insurance is projected to increase 13.5% next year or $200,000. That estimate came directly from our insurance provider. They basically said it would go from between 12 and 15 and we did right smack in the middle of 13.5%. So those are all the inflationary pressures that in dollars increase that we put in our budget. Also in our budget, we have incorporated a 2% operating margin. Uh, as you know, we've lost a significant amount of money over the last few years. We need to generate a margin to reinvest back into this facility. Um, we've had a capital freeze for several years. Everything's been on hold, or a lot of things have been on hold. Uh, that's resulted in a higher than normal capital budget for 2025. This hospital is 50 plus years old. and needs to keep gone going capital improvements and equipment needs to be replaced to do the work we do. We need a margin to generate cash to fund our capital budget. So next, but we have been able to increase access um, in some areas without adding expenses within the hospital. So I'm proud to report out on that. Um, you've heard clearly that we're the only game in town and going elsewhere is not easy for our community. We have increased access in our primary care clinics. We brought Kaufman Hall in and saw that we needed to increase the number of patients seen per day. This has taken a lot of hard work by our providers and our staff in primary care. We met with the providers to identify the barriers of why they weren't be able to meet the standards of benchmarks of 16 that we wanted to see. No shows was a huge reason for that. Um, they would start their days with a full schedule and the schedule would fall apart you know, midway through. So we concentrated on reducing the, the number of no-shows to keep the schedules full, and this provides access to our patients. Um, we also changed the new patient access process. We see new patients quickly for an acute problem and then schedule them out for their established visit to get them into our system and get them treated. We have added an employed psychiatric nurse practitioner, I can't talk, in our medical home. We have changed scheduling in our diagnostic imaging department um, this is allowed for later appointments for our scheduled procedures like MRIs and CAT scans, but that hasn't added any additional staff. Um, in the lab where we operate 24-7, we put in a new HA1C platform, which is a less expensive platform, and it also does more tests for our patients, so we don't have to send those out. So those are some of the things we've done for access. Um, I just want to say that every decision we make affects our community. Every service we can't continue means our patients have to travel, and every job we don't replace equals one less job for someone to have. We don't take this work lightly. Um, I'd like to turn this now over to Dr. Walker, our medical staff president, and he'll continue our presentation. Thank you. Um, my name is Greg Walker. I'm med staff president, uh, medical director of the OR, and uh, chair of the anesthesia department. Um, I've been here for just shy of 100 years. Um, I, uh, I grew up actually down the road 
when my folks moved here in 76, this hospital was just opening up. Um, I used to hit golf balls off in the open fields where all the medical villages now. I used to occasionally slice golf balls off the hospital window. I never broke any though. Um, <laughs> Anyways, I went to uh, went to high school here, went to UVM, went to UVM Medical School, uh, went to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for all my training. Well, not all. I went to Rochester, New York for some of my fellowship. Uh, but came back here in 1995, and uh, and here I am. Um, and uh, because of growing up here and working here for 30 years, I've been able to observe uh, one firsthand with my own family. Uh, but also as a physician here, how important this community hospital is to this community. Um, and, and make no mistake, um, we are a true community hospital. We are not a specialty hospital. Um, that is not our role. We are a community hospital. Um, and as, as, uh, as Tom said, you know, we, we take care of our own here uh, because we have to. Uh, Unfortunately, the folks up here, um, as you're very well aware of, it sounds like a broken record, but do not have the resources to just get up and go somewhere. Um, according to Vermont Digger a year ago, you know, we have the lowest car ownership of any place in the state, and a lot of those cars aren't going to pass inspection. Um, they're driving around with uh, uninspected cars. Um, you know, if you have a heart attack, we take care of you here. If you have a pediatric emergency here, we take care of you here. If you have a bowel obstruction, we take care of you here. If you need your appendix out, your gallbladder out, you have an ectopic pregnancy, you wanna have a baby, we, we do that stuff here. We don't do a lot of fancy stuff. We do the stuff of a true community hospital. We really don't have very much specialists. We, we have Mike Hayes coming back as a cardiologist in about a month. That's that's it. Um, we have a few um, uh, nephrologists that help out with from UVM with our dialysis unit, but you know it's 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 our primary care docs, our, our ER docs, which are are fantastic, our hospitalists, which are are fantastic, our general surgeons, our our, our one orthopedic surgeon, our OBGYN guys, they we take care of it all, and and because of the fact that we don't have any specialists, every one of our Doc's punch is way above his weight, um, and uh, because we have to, um, the the because of the the nature of where healthcare is in the state of Vermont, we just can't ship our patients to a tertiary uh, on a whim. We we have to take care of them here, and so we we do have we, we and we're finding the patients are like you hear from every place the patients are sicker. Um, they require a lot more care. We're we're doing taking care of these patients with less, you know, trying to have the, the, the staff here is, is difficult. We, we, we do less and less. I mean, one of the reasons this, this place survives is we do the same amount as a lot of other places with less people. Um, and we've been doing that for years. Um, unfortunately, with the way the staffing thing is, has evolved, we, we have less people even, and it really, really makes it difficult to, uh, to keep, keep on our mission, but we, you know, we have a dedicated uh, group of people working at this hospital, and uh, we keep figuring out a way to do it. Fortunately, we have an uh, administration that's in place now, uh, realizes that, and is incredibly supportive of us. Um, the survey that, that uh, Tom mentioned, uh, the, the highest scores actually came from the physicians. Um, Tom didn't mention that, but the hospital, the, for the most part, the docs here feel very, very supported. And, you know, we couldn't do that if, if, if we didn't feel supported because we were, a lot is asked of our, of our physicians here and, and of all the staff. Um, so I just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just sum, wrap it up saying, you know, um, I, I'm not sure how many of you've actually made it up here to see us in action and stuff, but we, we really are a true, uh, community hospital um, and this place our community I, I don't know what they would do if we weren't here mr. right hmm. thank you very um, uh, first of all my, uh, my name is Steve I'm the president general manager of, of Jay Peak uh, ski resort I've been there for 
a uh, little more than 20 years, and I've been involved with running ski resort operations in the state of Vermont for more than 30 years. I've been on the board um, as the vice chair uh, here for several years, and, and <clears throat> before I make my two small points here, I, I, on behalf of uh, the board, our board chair, Louise Bonvecchio, I, I want to thank Tom and his, not only his senior team, the folks in this room, the senior team outside of it, but uh, every single human being that, that works uh, at this hospital, because as you've heard, um, you know, here here this afternoon, you know, this notion of of cutting and reduction and softening and elimination uh, does not just happen at the senior level. Um, they are they are they they guide uh, the process here at the hospital, but everybody has been involved um, with making those numbers happen. When we start to talk about changing web hosts. Uh, in order to save $11 a month, or uh, switching out coffee grounds or coffee cups in the uh, the commissary in order to save uh, the bottom right hand corner, uh, you know that everybody is coordinated. Everybody is on the same team. I, I've, uh, you know, usually the best part about the, bu uh, the budget process, um, you know, for me, I've been doing ski resort budgets for 30 years. The best part about it is the fact that there's only one a year. Um, that's brings a lot of joy that we only have to go through this process once and I, and I have great empathy for y'all uh, on this side of the TV having to go through this uh, multiple times here. Um, but I have to say this has been uh, the strictest, uh, most thorough budget process that I have ever been a part of. Usually at JP, when we build our operating budgets, there are some areas of, for lack of a better word, fat and fluff uh, that we have the expectation that we will trim at some point. I can tell you that uh, if we are not at the bone here, we are certainly within sight of the bone. Um, and this notion of, of, of cutting, like I said, reducing and eliminating, uh, from my perspective up at the mountain and the 2,000 people that, that I either directly or indirectly manage there, part of being able to attract new talent into this region, and, and as JP is the, you know, one of the highest taxpayers in the region, Part, part of the ability to, to bring people on board and to keep them on board is, a, is not only a hospital in the region um, that is close by, but a functioning hospital, a hospital that, that they feel can serve their needs and that ultimately they in turn can be proud of. Um, it is a critically important piece to us there in terms of being able to uh, attract people uh, into the area. Um, but, this, but this notion of, of labor here specifically at the hospital, um, as I said prior, everybody has been involved in this reduce, cut, and eliminate process. And the reason that we have been successful with that is because we have an engaged team here, a smart team here, uh, that has pulled together, understood the mission, and moved forward through it. Um, that will only happen um, for as long as they continue to feel appreciated and acknowledged. And the way to not do that is to give them a, a dollar um, when inflation is suggesting that everything else costs three dollars more. Now, that is not a way to go forward. We cannot continue to keep the staff engaged at a level that we need them to in order to make smart operational decisions. Um, I know that you understand that. I know that you will hear that from other folks, but as the folks in this room have mentioned before, given where we are, given who we are, uh, that need to keep staff here, keep the best staff that we have here, and welcome new staff onto the team is critically important. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that you have uh, patiently sat back and listened to us, and I'm sure that you have questions going forward. Thank you, Steve. I'll turn it back over to you folks for questions. Thank you. Um, Tom, can you hear me okay? Just want to make sure I'm yes, having sir. some issues with audio today. Um, that was very moving and informative, and I really appreciate that presentation very, very much. So thank you for the work you put in to make it such a, such a strong presentation. Um, I'll turn to member Lunge for any questions she may have, but, but thank you all. Thank you, everyone. And I wanted to just start by saying uh, thank you for your diligence on the expense side. I think what you've managed to accomplish is really impressive. So I wanted to just out of the gate say, you know, appreciate that and appreciate all that you've done uh, to really drill down and um, and look at your budget. Um, I did have a few follow-up questions. Some of my questions actually were answered um, in your presentation. Um, 
but one of the things I wanted to ask you about was um, the shift in primary care from locums to staff. Again, kudos uh, in terms of reducing um, that. How does that, how would you say that has also impacted um, your primary care in terms of that shift from locums to staff? You want me to give it a shot? Or you yeah, want to take go ahead. So I'll start off. So um, we had a situation in our Barton Clinic where it was sort of the perfect storm uh, several years ago where we lost two long-term physicians. One, not our doing. Uh, either one wasn't our doing. One left to join sort of a concierge practice, uh, and one left to become a hospital since, since has left our organization. Um, so we were in um, disarray, let's say, in Barton. So by hiring these two new physicians to replace locum, you know, and we had a very good locum, don't get me wrong, she was excellent, but she wasn't long-term, right? She wasn't vested, invested, however you want to describe it. And so I think for the staff, for our patients, for the community, obviously it's a huge improvement. You know, I heard from patients about the lack of our positions. Where are they? Why can't we get them? Um, you know, shifting from one to the other. You know, when those physicians left, um, one in particular, he left behind 2,000 plus patients that we had to reassign. Um, that's a lot of people. Um, and, you know, and Barton, you know, as part of the Northeast Kingdom is, is a very, you know, economically challenged area. So to be able to bring back positions and um, that's huge. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. Trace, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. No, I, I think you covered it. I mean, there was the, the staff there were having a hard time. I mean, having new new locums come in feels very unsettling to them, unsettling for them for their, their positions even. And we, of course, didn't want to lose any staff. So, you know, being able to say we're recruiting and be able to say we had these successes really went a long way for the morale there and kind of stabilizing that staff and kind of cementing them in place. Just hold on for with us for a little bit more. And we were able to, you know, make that happen. You so. know, and one other comment on that too is, is what, our staff was experiencing, which I think is very, it's very common since COVID. And I don't know what's happened to people, but they were being verbally abused. Um, you know, when, you know, your physician leaves and you're giving them to a locum or to an APP and you're moving them multiple times, you know, people's fuses are short. And our staff was having to, uh, to really put up with a lot of stuff that was so inappropriate. Um, so to now to be able to have positions there that are long term, um, I think will, you know, it'll alleviate a lot of hopefully that that issue. Would you expect uh, maybe this improved relationship in Barton to have any impact on your ED wait time, your ED uh, utilization? I think there's a very strong possibility that could happen. As I said earlier, you know, you know, our Medicaid population will often use our ED as primary care. So sure. as, as we build additional access and they have a physician um, that they become, you know, sort of a partner with, yeah, I do think it will, to be honest with you. We haven't accounted for that in any of our numbers because it's too soon to, to try sure. to do that. But yep. when you think about it, it does make sense. You know, if I can comment yeah, on please. that. Um, unfortunately, Robin, one of the things we battle with uh, patients utilizing the ER for primary care, it's a cultural thing that has been done for generations and a large percentage of these folks that are using it for primary care. And no matter how, how much access you give to an office, this is just their culture. Um, and, and it's trying to change that culture, which is very, very difficult. Sure. Yeah. Which gets back to waste in healthcare. Yeah. Yep, that makes sense. Um, in terms of your 4.5 rate increase, um, that the 4.5 is on charges, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Just wanting to make sure I'm understanding because. There are a couple of discrepancies, so just trying to understand. And it, in your uh, narrative, you indicated you weren't going to apply that to the medical group. So is, my assumption is that'll be inpatient and outpatient only? Correct. OK, great. Because, of, because we're on a fee schedule for right. our positions in the outpatient world. That makes sense. Correct. 
that I was sort of guessing that, but it's always good to actually understand that the guess is accurate. <laughs> we appreciate the question. Um, yeah, and uh, thank you for expanding on the relationship with NVRH. That was one of the que follow-up questions I was going to ask is to expand on that, but I feel like you've covered that in a lot of detail, so I appreciate that. Um, I was noticing in your in your wait times data that you submitted that uh, for the most part your you know wait times are pretty good um, with psych and cardiology of course being challenging. Um, I assume can you connect that back to some of the changes that you talked about today a little bit and uh, what you would expect in those yeah. two particular areas in terms of access? Yeah, absolutely. So the prior cardiologist that we did have was working basically every other week. So like a half time cardiologist. So therefore, yeah. you know, that's where you're going to see those big wait times. Dr. Sure. Hayes, who's starting in the middle of September, will be here full time. So okay. that will automatically help drive down those wait times. So that's um, what we're doing there. Um, psych is, is a, a different, uh, kind of a different animal. We do have that full-time NP, and that, but that's the wait times that you've seen. So, um, okay, yeah. you know, there's no plan in the budget right now to necessarily alleviate that unless we can um, somehow, you know. So, so we have no plans to hire a psychiatrist. Right. Yes. Um, a, it's a very difficult recruitment. B, if you really get down to the nitty gritty, it's definitely a loss leader from a revenue expense perspective. Um, the world hasn't woken up to the fact that um, psychiatry and mental health needs to be treated like any other disease and reimbursed the same way. Thank you. Um, in your presentation, you talked about your telehealth um, contract with Dartmouth and um, you provided us with a per patient visit amount. I was what, what I wanted to ask is how you came to that. We heard from an earlier hospital that their contract with Dartmouth was a fat was a flat fee. So mm -hmm. is that uh, is that per visit amount basically the flat fee divided by the number of patients? Yes. Yes, exactly. Oh, okay. Okay. And, and and I gotta tell you, we're looking under every rock with respect to reimbursement. Um, we've contacted CMS and they put us through the runaround. Um, we can't seem to get any answers of how to get reimbursed any better than the numbers I quoted you. Yes. Okay. Thanks. I just wanted to understand that better because we it had been described as a flat fee, which didn't immediately translate to me into a per person. Um, and I think that's actually all that I have um, right now. I look through my notes, but I'll let others ask in case. And if I miss anything, I'll pop back. So back to you, Chair Foster, or anybody else who wants to jump in? Yes, I'll jump in here. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I want to echo my colleagues. I really appreciate all the hard work that you are doing, um, you know, along the lines of the morale, the quality, the expense production, the collaborations with NBRH. Really, really um, excited to hear about all of that. And acknowledge, just want to acknowledge, I think that we all recognize the unique challenges that North Country faces your location and your pair mix um, make, you know, the hard work that you're doing even more admirable um, and the stories that you shared today devastating and hard to hear. So appreciate all that you're doing on those fronts. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit. I just want to I, I understand a little bit about what your expectations are on the reimbursement rates. So the 4.5 I recognize is on the commercial side. I think I saw in your narrative the assumption was a zero percent increase from Medicaid, right? Right. Yes. 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 Um, and then I just wanted to understand um, what you were expecting from traditional Medicare and then Medicare Advantage. So I I don't have those specific numbers broken down, but I will tell you for Medicare on the inpatient side of the house, we don't. If we increase our charges, it's a per diem rate, so we don't get any additional we don't get any additional reimbursement. On the outpatient side of the house, it is a it is uh, being critical access. It is a percent of charge, so there is a dollar amount, which I can get you those those details after. I just don't have them in in front of me. And for uh, Medicare Advantage, um, we're paid fee scheduled for the majority of that, so there's not a, any net added into our um, reimbursement structure for the Medicare Advantage piece. Okay. It would be helpful to understand. If you could, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
No, no, no. Go ahead. It'd be helpful to understand what you what you're expecting on net from Medicare Advantage. Other hospitals are projecting some increase on their oh. Medicare Advantage reimbursement rate, and it sounded like from what you had described, you're expecting zero on Medicare yeah. Advantage. So I just would, I would like to understand that a little bit. If you could follow up. Um, yeah, what, you know, yep, we did and build also, in, you know, the traditional yep. how that breaks out. We did build in zero for that for sure. You built in uh, zero. Yep. Okay. Um, and what proportion of your Medicare population, or is it right, uh, of your revenue comes from Medicare Advantage? Six, we're up to 16%. Yep. Okay. Double where we were Double last year. Double last year, yeah. 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 The infiltration rate seems high and growing. Um, the federal government loves it. Um, uh, so I know I'm sure that you've spent some time poking around the RAND 5.0 because you know that the board is intrigued by this as a, a, it, a, a data point to help us understand relative prices. And if we look, you know, at North Country, the standardized price on outpatient is really quite high. It's the most expensive in the state by a fair amount, more expensive than Dartmouth, more expensive than UVM. Um, but even on the inpatient side, not the highest, but really much higher than other similarly sized hospitals. And I'm just wondering if you can help us interpret that, help the public interpret that, um, what's driving the relatively high standardized prices on both inpatient and outpatient? Well, I think it has a lot to do with our payer mix. Yeah. Um, there's only so many opportunities for us to generate any additional revenue over and above what we would usually get. Um, you know, Medicaid has expanded, which is great. I mean, it's great that people have insurance. It's great we have Medicaid. But your own data last year shows that for every Medicaid patient we see, we lose money. Medicare breaks even. And, um, and the little bit of commercial is what generates the over overage on revenue. We only have so many places that we can um, put the fee increases on, to be honest with you. Um, you know, 25% yeah. of our organization, we can't put any fee increase on. So when we say four and a half, it's really four yeah. that we're applying. Um, so that does have to do it. I know you asked that sort of a, you made a similar statement last year um, about our charges are high. Um, and of course, charges don't necessarily uh, relate to reimbursement. And I, I, um, I'm just wondering, have you ever done the calculation, for example, for this year, for, for fiscal year 25, if Medicaid increased their rate or the reimbursement by 1%, any sense of how that might drop your commercial rate ask? We have not, but we can certainly do that. I mean, if Medicaid, with our high population, Medicaid yeah. was to increase 1%, I think we'd throw a party. Yeah. Well, that's what I, I would love to know what that dollar amount is. And I think you should. We can get you that. that. Absolutely. <laughs> get you. And then we'll invite you to the party. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, let me ask a little bit about um, the primary care losses. Um, so that was intriguing to me too, just also because when we look at that standardized price, it seems like, you know, outpatient $605 for an outpatient service. It's surprising that the primary care would be losing money. Um, I think you described it was $4 million a year. Now it's 1.5. So congratulations. That, that's a big turnaround um, on primary care. I'm wondering, do you have a sense of how many patient visits per day would allow the primary care practice to break even? You know, like you've got it, you went from 12 to 14 per day, now to 16 per day. How many patients so, per day would a provider have to see to break even in that practice? So um, so let's let's start off with that whole conversation about primary care. So, you know, there, you know, if you're a private primary care physician or APP, let's just say, you get credit for all the ancillaries, right? So the labs, diagnostic imaging, that would all be credited to your clinic. In a hospital-based model, all of the ancillary revenue that is assigned goes to the hospital and is not in the clinic. Mm -hmm. So it would be very rare for any primary care clinic to quote-unquote break even from just seeing E&M codes. Oh. Now, we do get a very high reimbursement for visits in primary care because we are our rural health uh, designation allows us to get that reimbursement. Um, what happened for us to go so far in the negative, it goes right back to Cerner. Um, prior to Cerner coming on board, our physicians were seeing, when I left the organization four years ago and went to Rutland, we were seeing 20 plus patients a day. Okay, With the implementation of Cerner, that number dropped dramatically because of the difficulty in using the EMR in the system. 
On top of that, in order for the system to function appropriately for our providers to see the patients, we had to hire more staff. We became very inefficient. Tracy mentioned the no-shows. Um, with Athena, it would pop up North Country Hospital when you got your text or a phone call reminding you of your appointment. With Cerner, when you have an appointment coming up, that phone call that you might get could be from Colorado, California, Arizona. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see an Arizona number come up, I don't answer it. So that was contributing mightily to our no-show. So we've had to put bodies, physical paid bodies, to help with that process in a call center. And we haven't been as efficient as we could be. We are just really figuring out how to utilize Cerner from an efficiency perspective to be able to see the 16. It's, it's not a very pretty story, but yeah. it's very fact-based. Yeah, no, I believe you and I appreciate your honesty there. Um, are you, I know you can't talk about it, but are you optimistic about a settlement that will alleviate some of those $10 million of losses from Cerner? Uh, I'm optimistic that we chose the right attorney, Quinn Emanuel. Uh, they're a na national uh, law firm. Um, they have offices in Boston. They actually rep are representing the VA in a billion dollar lawsuit against Cerner. Um, so I'm confident that we have the right attorneys. Okay. Um, as you're describing all that you've had to do to get Cerner to increase efficiency and, and the throughput of patients, but you also talked about um, potentially working with UVM to, to move to Epic. Is there a timeline on that? And what is the impact on productivity implementation costs in terms of maybe not necessarily dollar costs, but provider, you know, onboarding costs and those sorts of things? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So timing is really going to be in line with what happens with our CERNA conversations, because we are in an airtight contract for the next five years, um, unless something changes. Um, when I say that we're looking at it, we're, we're not going to wait around to wait for the decisions to come down with respect to where we go with Cerner. We need to be ready to move. And so we're looking at Meditech. We're looking at Epic. There's two ways we can get into Epic at a fairly reasonable cost. When I say reasonable, reasonable for a critical access hospital. Uh, one is through UVM, through Community Connect, and the other is through an organization called Ocean. They have a group of about 30 to 50 critical access hospitals that host, they host Epic so that you can you can sort of jump into it. From a cost perspective, um, it would be expensive, but I can assure you, at the end of the day, it's going to be a heck of a lot better than where we are right now with Cerner. So it's short-term pain for long-term gain with respect to wherever we go. Um, to but estimate nothing's going to change exact, in 25. Doesn't sound like it, anything will change in 25. I would okay. say best case scenario is 26 uh, okay. at best. Um, and we are actually working on what the cost would be. Uh, for Ocean up front, we're looking at about seven or eight million dollars. Um, and that doesn't take into consideration anything behind the scenes with respect to lost opportunity. Okay. Um, my next question actually, I mean, the transportation challenges that you described, not only the cost to the, you know, the folks at the hospital trying to spend hours arranging transportation to being liable for transportation costs that are incurred that the patient doesn't have insurance to cover to the costs that patients are facing. I'm wondering, have you considered investing in your own transportation services, expanding that to defray some of the, the impact to your, to your community and frankly, to your bottom line? So uh, recently, no. Historically, yes. And so I led that initiative to look at what it would cost us from the purchase of, let's say, some sort of a, not necessarily an ambulance, but something for just standard transportation. Um, and then you have the liability issues, and then you have um, getting people to actually have the class two license that you need to drive it. Um, it was not what I would say was a win financially, but it can be something we again look at, but I gotta be honest with you, um, we just haven't taken that on right now. We've taken a lot on the last 16 months and we're just not ready to go looking at providing our own transportation. Yeah, it just seems like given all your collaboration efforts with NVRH, the transportation between the two sites is gonna become even more important. And it seemed like that cost benefit analysis might weigh in favor of the benefits, but I appreciate all that's on your plate so far. 
so. Uh, I will say that we have dollars. Um, you know, we do a lot of different fundraising activities, golf tournaments, et cetera. We raise money for a community fund. And for people that do have transportation, we do give gas cards um, so that they do have the ability at least to offset that cost. So we definitely do that. Okay. Um, a couple more questions. Uh, can you just tell me how many staffed beds you now have? What you're staffing for? 25. You're staffing for 25? 25 okay. total, yeah. Okay, and then what is your average daily census? Um, for lady, 24. Uh, for 24, our average daily census is 14. Or on our inpatient unit, PCU. Okay, so you staff for 25, but on average, there's only 14. We staff the census, but we... Have we have the no, capability. Again, to sorry, maybe I'm not hearing correctly. Sorry, I, I, I may so not be hearing accurately. 14. Okay, we don't we don't have we six nurses on for two patients. Um, you know, we staff okay. for 25, so we have the capability to see 25, but we only have the appropriate amount of staff if it's a census of 14. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, that made sense. Sorry, it might have been me not hearing correctly too. Um, thank you. Uh, and then my last question is just how has the closure of that of the Newport Healthcare Center affected North Country in terms of custodial patients, in terms of being able to discharge uh, to nursing homes? Is there anything that you've noticed particularly about that closure, how it's impacted North Denise, Country? That's on you. Last year, we really struggled with um, having long-term care patients, patients waiting for facility placement. But our case managers have been more proactive. We've been um, working with families to be sure that they're applying for Medicare, Medicaid, if it's appropriate, long-term care insurance. We've also started making sure that when a patient is admitted to our inpatient unit, there's information there. There's a QR code where families can look at the facilities that are available in the community where we can transfer patients to. We're trying to have those conversations earlier. So last year there was a lot of desperation and families were just dropping their family members off. We haven't experienced that as much lately now that we're trying to be more proactive and have those conversations sooner. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you. Um, any other board member questions? I don't have any uh, questions, but I'd, <clears throat> I'd just like to thank the team for presenting to us. I feel like I've learned a lot uh, last year when you presented and this. Um, you know, seeing what you're, you're dealing with um, and how you're dealing with it, um, I find personally kind of inspirational. You're, you're dealing with a, a chaotic situation that has unfolded um, around you. And what I'm interested in, and I think the other board members are interested in, um, are how we can make some smoother transitions um, with our healthcare system so that um, we're not uh, other areas of the state aren't faced with some of the some of the difficulties that you're reporting. And I found the stories that you're sharing very moving and the dedication to the area with people growing up there and moving back, um, all of it just uh, inspiring. And I want to thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. I did have one quick follow up um, from a question that I missed, um, but I think it'll be fairly quick. So. I know that you resubmitted some information last week. I wanted to make sure I understood what the updates were so that if I, that I didn't miss anything. I just didn't want to miss anything in the update. So I think in your workbook submission, you updated some of the um, other operating expense lines and that that was the major change there. And then in the, um, the other sub part of the submission, I think it was the productivity, clinical productivity that was updated. Was there anything that I missed there that I should make sure I go back and take a look at? Yeah, no. So for the the um, 
the first part you mentioned that was just changing a bucket um yeah. controller found out so the none of the none of the bottom line never changed it was just a bucket change where the locum expense was and then the productivity schedule i missed red um saying if we needed to do it or not so that was just the first time i had submitted it so it wasn't a change it was just an original submission so great yes. thank you mm -hmm. Hey, this is Dave Merman. I've got a couple questions. Thanks. I, I I apologize for not getting up there for your community meeting in July. Um, I heard that uh, you had a very active community meeting, and I would have liked to have been there. So I I, I would like to make a trip up to, to uh, North Country at some point and, and see what things are like there. Um, we would love to host you. We have a very active community. It sounds <laughs> sounds like it. It's that's great. Um, I have a few questions and a comment. Most of them have been answered. One, there was a discussion of RAND pricing, and I just wanted to clarify that my understanding of RAND pricing is the data comes from the prices that are paid uh, by the insurers, not the charges. So I think that's one thing that's sort of important to keep in mind because it, it gets rid of that charge, discount off charge relationship, and it looks at the, the, the actual, what they're referring to as the price as opposed to the charge. Okay. Um, you mentioned the rural health designation increases reimbursement for primary care. Is that only for Medicare? Medicaid also. Yeah, and Medicaid. And Medicaid. Okay. I believe um, what's thirty three dollars a visit? It's more than that. More than that now. It's it's, it's it, we've done a really. I got a uh, comment on that. We've done an amazing job to make sure that we're not leaving any dollars on the table with respect to the rural health. Um, when Cop and Hall came in, they said it was. Um, we had optimized it as high or higher than any other primary care they had seen. So it's the only way we can be sustainable is when we do that. That's great. So um, I think I have the most updated version of the workbook from us, and there's some things in here that look a little strange that I would just like for you to check and see if this doesn't make sense to you. Um, I have Budgeted FY24 Medicaid inpatient revenue is 172,000 and it rises to 561,000, which seems like a really low number to me. Of Medicare traditional going down from 24 budget to 25 budget by about 50% for inpatient care, with Medicare Advantage going up by about, uh, you know, one down by 4 million, the other one up by 600,000. So I'm just curious what's is is this true that your inpatient revenue is really declining substantially, uh, at least in the public payers from 24 to 25? So I don't have that detail in front of me. I'm I'm okay. afraid I can't speak. To, I I'll be glad to speak to it offline or at, you know with any questions you have. I will tell you that our inpatient revenue has declined. Our we have actually seen a decrease in our inpatient, and we've seen a decrease in our swing beds, a pretty substantial one from uh, budget 24. So I don't know if they jive with the numbers you're talking about, but we do, I have to look and I have to make sure that you have, you're looking at the rate decompensation, whatever, de yeah. that schedule. Yep. The, um, yep. So I have to make sure that you have the most recent one because we've had to make changes to that. That was a little complicated. Um, so um, I'll be glad to go back to it and answer your questions on those. I just don't have it in front of me and able to into that detail on the fly, I'm afraid, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, maybe I'll send you, maybe I'll write up some questions. Yeah, that would be great if you could do that, the, yeah. Because the other thing on that, um, which was a little surprising to me, given the context, well, I guess it's sort of complicated with Medicaid because you partially get a fixed perspective payment for Medicaid and then you also get fee for service, but it looked as if, right. as if outpatient Medicaid was declining substantially as, as well maybe on net by a million and a half or something like that, which didn't seem consistent with what you're saying. So all right, I'll, I'll follow that up. Yes. Yeah. And then the last question I had was on, on telehealth. So my understanding somewhat with telehealth is, would, would you say that telehealth allows you to deliver care to more complex patients at North Country? Denise? I think it does. I mean, the tele neuro, because we don't have a neurologist on staff, and our neurology uh, volume is steadily increasing. They, you know, they um, assess the patient and they make recommendations in, in the emergency department. The physicians then write the orders and carry those out. So I do feel like they do, they see our sickest 
some of our sickest patients, those here with mental health changes, neuro changes, stroke, all those okay. things. So it's, and sorry, it's mostly or entirely psychiatry and neurology? Yes. Okay. So what I guess my question is, does that allow you to then bill more complex codes, which would increase the facility fee by having those specialists available to sort of offset the telehealth expense? Not from what, I mean, we, like Tom said, we've called CMS, we've, we've tried to, we've talked to Dartmouth because that's what our telemedicine, that's where our telemedicine is through to try to understand um what we should be charging and we haven't charged more because of more complex so, patients so what you, I, I, let me see if i understand exactly what you're saying dr merman are you saying that you know based on our ability to work with them we might be able to have more downstream revenue by you know utilizing diagnostic imaging or what have you that we might not have without their recommendations is that what you're saying yeah like billing higher uh, like facility fees associated with more complex DRGs. No, 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 I don't think no. so. Uh, and we're trying to figure it out. And we've talked to other hospitals, and I think they're struggling as well uh, on how to bill for um, exactly what you're saying. Um, as opposed to the professional side, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah right. we're not. It's Q codes. It's facility code only that we're able to bill. And all we all we know is that it's one it's one charge. And it's not based on acuity. No one seems to have the answer. Right. Maybe I right. can contact C CVMC and see what they do. <laughs> yeah, you should. Uh, they, they. Well, I'll tell you because I work at CVMC in the emergency department. There, uh, you know, they use UVM's teleneuro, but I don't know if they, you know, in the ED, if my patient if they charge a professional charge to the UVM teleneuro. I, I, I kind of doubt they do, but um, as an ED provider, uh, you know, it's a huge resource to be able to have a teleneurologist to help you with complex stroke management, especially TPA decisions. And, uh, and, and, and we have no plans to stop that service. So, all right, well, thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, just a couple of small, quick questions. Do you know what percentage of your costs for, for Medicaid patients are Oh, there we go. Oh, sorry. I've been having issues all day. I'm sorry. Uh, my question was, what, what's the cost coverage for Medicaid at, at North Country? Uh, um, give me a little more detail. For any Medicaid patient you see, what percentage of the reimbursement covers the cost of providing that care? Actually, that's I believe that's one of the questions that was on our question sheet, and I'm uh, working with our cost report people to try to come up with a calculation for that for uh, 23 Chair Foster. I don't have that today, but it'll be part of our written response. Is that what we're at, you're asking about? Yes. That was the set yeah. of questions you had asked us yeah. Uh, yeah. last week. Yeah. yeah. So it'll be part of our written our written uh, responses for you, so you'll have that information. And then, you know, given your payer mix, are, are you in any conversations or have you made any efforts to have the legislature or Medicaid increase those Medicaid payments? So I've had conversations with our local legislators, um, and I do have um, the chair of uh, the health care um, health care committee coming to visit in September. So um, believe me, I'm not going to be shy about having those conversations, as you can probably imagine. Do you have any optimism that that might be something that could be addressed given the shortfall you're experiencing? Hope's not a strategy. <laughs> we say that Fair, a point. <laughs> yeah. Fair point. Fair um, point. And then we heard a lot this morning from um, Grace Cottage about the, the philanthropy they experienced. They're in a different socioeconomic area. 
but do you have any large employer philanthropic support that you're getting or is there any appetite or uh, possibility of, a, of seeking philanthropy? So, you know, our biggest, as you can imagine, there's not a lot of industry here uh, in the Northeast Kingdom. Yeah. Um, our biggest supporters uh, from a dollar and cents perspective, I'll be honest with you, tends to be the local banks. Um, you know, both uh, two of our larger, two, two of the banks, M&T, I believe it was, mm -hmm. and Community National donated significant dollars toward our ED project so that we could uh, make each room a uh, negative pressure. Um, we have a foundation that raises quite a bit of money throughout the community and every year they have a different project that they uh, donate to us based on those foundation dollars and next year um, you know through our fundraising activity it's going to be based on upgrading a new mammography unit or diagnostic imaging but we don't have that one uh, unfortunately go to you know maybe Steve J Peak anything you want to give us Steve? we're going to pay the staff and lift tickets that was my suggestion but I got I got shot down <laughs> Um, okay, I don't have any other questions. Thanks for all the work that you guys are doing and for your presentation. It was really um, quite informative today, so I appreciate it very, very much. And um, I have gotten up there a couple times, and I had a really sure. enjoyable time getting to meet with Tracy when I came up, and I yeah. enjoyed your community meeting very, very much. So thank you for having me and inviting me up there. And Anytime, maybe guys. hopefully again. Um, uh, okay, and I'll turn to the healthcare advocate. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks, everyone. I just have one clarification question. I know it's been a long, long day. Um, and uh, so I think this is following up on a question that Member Holmes or Member Lunch asked um, about the, I think it was um, Member Holmes, about the closure of the Newport Healthcare Center. One part of your narrative, I just had a clarification. You said you wrote that you had patients without a payer source, making it a challenge to find an accepting facility. Um, am I correct in assuming that the main accepting facilities around you would that what what would those be? And just could you elaborate on that a bit more? The facilities in the community that we um, send patients to for long term care: Bel Air, Maple Lane, um, and Union House, and Michonne Manor. Okay. Okay. And there's okay. Thanks. I just wanted to clarify that. That's all. I, that's all I had. I was just curious about it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Um, I think that's all we have uh, for you folks. So we have public comment at the end of the hearing days on all the hospitals. You're welcome to stick around and hear any public comment. You're welcome to go, whatever your preference. Um, sometimes there's a lot. Sometimes there's none. So um, with that, I will open it up to public comment via the raise the hand function. All right, seeing none, um, I will move and ask the board if there's any old or new business for the board. And I will move that we adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All right.